this conference, the first of the conference this week on youth mental health and COVID-19, what do we know and what should we do? And this conference, as you know, is on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday this week, and it's brought to you by the Emerging Minds Network and the Centre for Society and Mental Health. So my name is Cathy Creswell and I'm a Professor of Developmental Clinical Psychology from the University of Oxford and I'm the Director of the Emerging Minds Network. So I'm delighted to welcome you all today. And today we'll be focusing on the evidence base and overall trends. So what's the evidence on the impact of COVID-19 and related responses on the mental health of children and young people? So we're going to be getting started with some short presentations from our speakers and then we'll have time at the end for a panel discussion where we're really pleased to be also hearing from a number of young people who've been involved in various projects relating to mental health and um, in the context of the pandemic. Uh, as many of you already have, please do post in the chat and introduce yourselves. Um, really great to get a sense of who's who's there and um, and it's great to to get everybody involved. Um, as you may know, um, Andre from the Mental Elf is with us today. He'll be live tweeting. So if you're tweeting, please do use the hashtag uh, YouthMHCOVID um, and we'll post a tweet in the Zoom chat so people can share that on their social media if they want to. So do have a look out for that. Um, we'll have a panel at the end, as I mentioned, and we've got some pre-submitted questions that we'll be using then. But if you do have any questions for clarification for our speakers, please do use the Q&A feature for that so that uh, those don't get lost amongst the chat. So chat for introductions, um, Q&A for clarification questions. The conference is also being live streamed on the Mental Health YouTube channel and it will be available there after the event. So if you do need to nip out at any point and uh, want to come back or you want to watch it again, uh, you will be able to do so there. And we'll also put, be putting links to the YouTube recordings of the conference and the presentation slides on both the Emerging Minds and the Centre for Society and Mental Health websites. Now, before we start, we also just wanted to highlight that, of course, we're going to be talking about some difficult and sensitive topics today. So if you do feel unwell or unsafe uh, or um, in any way troubled at any point during the webinar and you'd like someone to speak to confidentially, please do send a private message within the chat to Lindsay. So Lindsay will be posting a message now in the chat so that you can see her. Um, and it also you'll see her name is flagged help and support message me. So um, please do make use of that if you need to. But that's enough from me. I will uh, now um, with pleasure introduce our first speaker, who is Dr. Tamsin Newlove Delgado from the University of Exeter. And Tamsin is a senior clinical lecturer. Uh, with the Children and Young People's Mental Health Research Collaboration or CHIME at the University of Exeter and an honorary consultant in public health medicine with Public Health England and she's going to be talking to us today about tracking the impact of COVID-19 on the mental health of children, young people and families. So thanks very much for joining us Tamsin. Great, thanks very much, Cathy. So hopefully everybody can hear me okay and thanks for the invitation to come along today. So I'm speaking on behalf of the whole survey team here and I'll talk about who those are at the moment. Um, some bits and pieces of um, some of the talk I'm giving today might be a little bit more technical about how we carried out the survey. I'll try not to dwell on that too much, um, but that will just give those of you who are interested a little bit more of a flavour. So I'm going to be talking about the Mental Health of Children and Young People survey in England, um, the 2020 survey. And I'm also going to touch a little bit on our plans for the survey being carried out this year in 2021. Oops, there we go, just find it a bit, bit slow to move on. So the, these surveys have been funded by the Department of Health and Social Care and commissioned by NHS Digital. And much of their hard work was carried out by the Office for National Statistics and that's um, social research um, with input from me at the University of Exeter and um, Professor Townsend Ford at uh, the University of Cambridge. So a little bit of background, and I'll try not to make this particularly technical, but the national surveys at the moment are providing England's official statistics in child mental health. And they are what we call probability samples, which means that they are um, initially a random sample of children chosen to be as representative as possible of children and young people in the in England. 
And each of these surveys from 1999, 2004 and 2017 were, were cross-sectional and also had a three-year follow-up. But it just so happened um, this year that the three-year follow-up happened at the time of coronavirus. And um, therefore, we had some quite interesting opportunities to explore more about the impact, which I'll say a bit more about in a moment. Um, just briefly, how did, we, how did we sort of invite young people and um, children and parents to take part? Well, we went back to those who took part in the national survey in 2017 and asked if they were willing to take part again this year. And overall, we had about 3,500 young people who took part. That's about 45% of those that we invited. So we could have done a little bit better on that one. I'll talk about that in a moment too. So the two main aims that we had in MHCYP 2020 were to compare mental health in 2017 and 2020 um, using the same measure and to describe life during the COVID-19 pandemic for children and young people, as well as families, of course. So the design was an online questionnaire, uh, naturally, because this took place in July to August 2020. And we had a version for parents, children and young people. And the content included um, a questionnaire called the Strengths and Difficulties Questionnaire, which asked about emotional and behavioural difficulties, things like household circumstances, parents' mental health, how well families were getting on together, the impact of COVID on the household in terms of finances, but also social things, access to education services. And we also asked about children and young people's daily activities over the past seven days. And I just wanted to um, talk a little bit here about how we measured mental health in these surveys um, and a bit about terminology just briefly. So the strengths and difficulties questionnaire was our main measure of mental health. And we use these responses to calculate how likely a child or young person was to have a condition in terms of an emotional, behavioural or hyperactivity disorder or mental health problem. Um, so the terminology that's used in report is, is that of a probable mental disorder. I'm aware that's not always the preferred way of talking about these things, um, but just because I'm talking about the report, I'm going to have to use that same terminology throughout, so just that everybody is aware of that. So what actually happened, and I'm happy to take any technical questions about this in the chat if needed, but we combined the responses of parents and children using an algorithm to say whether a child was, was unlikely, possible or probable to have um, what we called a probable mental disorder. And so when I talk about prevalence or how common things are, that's what I'm talking about. So these were the headline findings. Um, Quite a number of you may already have seen these reported uh, from our report in autumn 2020. So whereas in 2017, one in nine children aged five to 16 um, had a probable disorder, in the 2020 survey, we found that this had risen to one in six. So that's really quite dramatic. And that would be, well, several children in a class of, of 30, if you think about it that way. And we found that this, these rates had increased across both genders between 2017 and 2020, so both for boys and for girls. And also across both primary and secondary age children, as you can see here, um, an increase both in those um, from primary age and secondary age. And although we had a relatively um, small sample of children, and young people from black and minority ethnic BAME backgrounds, again, we found the same increase, um, although from a lower base across both um, white children and those from a BAME background over time. We couldn't compare 17 to 22 year olds in 2017 with those in 2020 because the age groups were slightly different. But we did see, again, that amongst young women, more than one in four were identified as likely to have a probable disorder in 2020, which means, yet again, this is the group that we are perhaps particularly concerned about. And I just wanted to draw out a couple of extra findings. Um, there's so much that we could talk about in respect to the report and a lot we haven't even managed to analyse yet. Um, but one of the things that was interesting was the response to the question about the impact of lockdown on life. Um, so whilst the minority of children and young people said that lockdown had made their lives better or a lot better, um, overall, um, I think the majority said it had made their lives a little worse or a lot worse. And when we break this down by children um, according to their 
disorder status, as we've called it, those who were likely to have a mental health problem were much more likely to say that lockdown had made their lives a little or a lot worse, more than one in two actually uh, looking at this graph. And again, with loneliness, overall, one in 10 children reported and young people reported often or always feeling lonely. And again, when we broke this down by disorder, we found that more than a third of girls with a probable disorder reported often or always feeling lonely. So loneliness really being a very big issue. I also wanted to break down a few things about um, inequalities and risk and protective factors and how the impact of COVID on different families. So we found that children and young people with a probable um, mental disorder were more than twice as likely to live in a household that had fallen behind with payments. They were more likely to live in a household where the household couldn't afford to buy enough food or had to use food banks. They were more likely to report not having some kind of social support in terms of an adult to turn to. And when we think about protective factors, they were much less likely to have exercised outside or spent time with family or sat down and eaten a meal together with their family in the previous seven days. And then finally, I just wanted to highlight this about help speaking. So we found that among 17 to 22 year olds who were likely to have a mental health problem, um, overall, almost half reported not seeking help for some kind of mental health concern or a mental and physical health concern due to the pandemic when we asked them. So that's really quite concerning in terms of whether they've been able to get access to the help that they need. So just to summarise, um, our, our results um, do suggest that there's been a significant increase in um, mental health problems in children and young people between 2017 and 2020. There are concerns about the un unequal pandemic impacts and these are supported by our data. Uh, there are some limitations, sorry for the jargon on this slide, um, the fact that we couldn't, we didn't follow up people between 2017 and 2020 at six month intervals like we might have liked to do, which helps people keep in touch, but might also allow us to track exactly what had been happening. So we couldn't do that. And we also had to carry it out face to face, sorry, online rather than face to face. Just to let you know a little bit more about our further work, just very quickly, I'm not sure how I'm doing for time, um, but I think it's quite important to let you know that we have got some further work supported by funding. And that includes carrying up some follow up interviews with children and young people and parents to find out a lot more about their actual experiences during the pandemic. Um, and we're also at the moment carrying out wave two of MHCYP. So we're going back to those who took part in this wave that I'm talking about now as well as going back to those who took part in 2017. And this wave two is gonna ask about things like special educational needs and disabilities, and eating disorders, which we didn't have space to ask about in the first phase. And that will also be followed up by interviews. And then finally, we do plan to have a wave three in the summer of 2021. And this is all because what we have is a snapshot from July, August, 2020. And we know that a lot has changed from then. So we're hoping that with our follow-up waves, we will be able to track more about what has happened to children and young people. And I will stop there because I know we're really packed for speakers today. Um, and just finally to let you know that there are lots of resources uh, to the reports I've talked about um, all here uh, on the website of NHS Digital. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Tamsin, and wonderful timing. So thank you very much. And such a huge amount of data for us to draw on, which is fantastic. So thank you very much indeed. Just a reminder to people, um, this session has been really popular, which is um, we're really pleased that so many people have been interested in joining. But it does mean that some of you may be aware of people who've not been able to join the Zoom. Um, but it is currently being live streamed on YouTube so that anyone who couldn't get into the Zoom is able to watch it live on YouTube now. And so Andre's just popped the um, link to that in the chat. So if you know anyone who's struggling to get in, please do pass that on to them. So now going to uh, move on to our next speaker, who unfortunately wasn't able to join us today, um, however, managed to very um, efficiently make us a video uh, of her presentation, which hopefully you can see now. So I will just start playing that. COVID-19 pandemic and the 
Thank you. So I'm going to be talking about the co-space study tracking the mental health of children and young people over the course of the COVID-19 pandemic. And the aim of this project has really been to identify what protects children and young people in terms of their mental health over time and at particular stress points um, so that we can share those findings with policymakers to inform um, the development and provision of support. So the co-space survey um, is uh, involves parents and carers of school aged children aged four to 16. And if families have a young person aged between 11 and 16, they can also take part um, and report on themselves. And so the study started um, one week after the beginning of lockdown in March last year. So sadly, we don't have comparisons with pre-pandemic data, but we are able to look at patterns um, over the course of the pandemic. And so um, parents or carers and young people complete a monthly online survey. Um, and then more recently, we've also been interviewing families and young people to find out about their experiences in more depth. So more than 12,000 parents and carers have taken part so far, but it is important to stress this is not a representative sample. So about 90% of them are female, so largely mums. Um, most of them, two thirds are working, but we are overrepresented, overrepresented in terms of um, affluency. Um, and also there are more white British um, backgrounds than would be expected in the general population. So um, the findings that I'm going to present today are all based on parent or carer's um, report on their children, um, looking at three particular areas. So looking at children's um, attention. So this is things like concentration, um, how distractible they are, and, um, and also kind of high, hyperactivity, sort of restless, fidgety behaviour. And then looking at um, emotional difficulties. So things like feeling unhappy, um, worried, clingy. Um, and maybe having tummy ache or other kind of somatic symptoms. And then their behaviour. So this are thing, these are things like children not doing what their parents are asking them to do, um, having tantrums or getting into fights, that kind of thing. And we're looking at the data across the course of the pandemic from March last year until January this year. So let me start by showing you the general patterns in terms of what we've seen um, so based on parent uh, report, we've seen that children's mental health symptoms um, in first lockdown, where they were homeschooled from March till sort of May, June time, uh, we found an increase across all those three areas. And then we saw improvements in these areas after lockdown eased, so through July, for some holidays and um, uh, through September as, the open, as schools um, reopened. And then since the latest national lockdown was introduced in January, we've seen that difficulties have increased again. And this has been particularly the case in primary school aged children. So children aged four to 10 years old. And I thought it might also be useful to highlight um, data that we've got on parent uh, mental health. So symptoms of anxiety, stress and, and depression over this April to December time period, because you can see exactly the same pattern. So parents stress, increasing um, in that first lockdown during homeschooling. It reduced when lockdowns um, eased. And then as re new restrictions came into place at the end of last year, it then increased again. And so thinking about our finding that younger children um, seem to have particular increases in terms of symptoms during lockdown, it is likely that the demands of homeschooling alongside for many parents working may have been a particular challenge for parents of younger children who may be more reliant on their parents for support in, in homeschooling, um, but also generally throughout the day in terms of monitoring their children, providing for them um, and, and entertainment as well. Whereas the teenagers may have been much more independent during lockdown, especially this last lockdown where schools um, are providing a much more sort of structured learning environment remotely. And teenagers are also more likely to be able to maintain peer relationships through things like online chat and messaging and gaming than the younger children are. So we've also looked at child gender and for primary school age girls and boys, the patterns um, of difficulties over time were broadly similar, but latterly we've seen a difference in, in um, gender. So in January, um, we've seen the proportion of secondary school age girls with emotional problems has increased and you can see it's a, a different pattern for boys. 
Um, and in fact, in January this year, they've been at the highest level since um, March 2020. And in our interviews with adolescents, they've talked about having to deal with relentless uncertainty over the course of the pandemic with worries about day to day things like their education and their friendships, as well as longer term things like exams and their future. And they've also talked about a huge sense of loss in daily experiences, such as hanging out with friends um, and more significant events. And it may be that this is all having a particular impact um, for girls. Throughout the pandemic, we've seen some groups displaying a consistently elevated level of mental health symptoms, um, and that's been across all three areas. And those groups are children with special educational needs and or developmental differences, so children with autistic spectrum disorders, ADHD, um, and children from lower income households and also single adult households. Um, and given the nature of these difficulties, it's understandable that many areas of life are difficult from learning to um, social interactions um, and a range of pressures that might be particularly um, impactful on children. So, you know, if you've got less time to support your child in home learning, you've got less space to work, less access to devices, a less stable Internet connection. All of those things are likely to have an impact, as well as parents' mental health likely to be um, have more significant difficulties in particular groups as well. We've also more recently looked at siblings and seen that parents um, have reported that where they have an only child, that child had more attentional hyperactivity difficulties throughout the pandemic. And again, it may be that if you don't have a sibling, you're less physical in your play, you're maybe more sedentary in your behaviour, and maybe that has a knock-on impact on your concentration um, and your sort of restless behaviour at other times. We've also been looking at patterns over time to identify different groups in each of these three areas of difficulty. And so this, these, these um, figures are over that first four months of lockdown. You can see that there's a stable group, the red line, which looks low and it doesn't really change much over that time period. And encouragingly, that is sort of between 49 and 68 percent of the young people in our sample. Um, but there are those who you can see are elevated throughout and some who get worse over time. And, and those are the ones that we're particularly interested in better understanding. So those children and um, adolescents that have elevated symptoms by the end of this July period were more likely to be younger in age, have a parent or a carer with high levels of psychological distress, be more likely to have special educational needs or neurodevelopmental difficulties, and for those that had conduct or behaviour difficulties and hyperactivity um, sort of attentional difficulties, we could also see that those groups were more likely to be characterised by a higher level of family conflict and lower levels of family warmth. So the findings um, across all of these different areas really identify important areas of concern in terms of the potential impact of the pandemic and particularly um, lockdowns. Um, on children and young people's adjustment. And it will be important for us to see what happens as we come out of this current lockdown. So clearly developing an understanding of who's been most severely affected by the pandemic and in what ways is going to be really crucial in thinking about um, policy and how we might target effective support um, where it's most needed. So this has obviously been a bit of a whistle stop tour of our findings. You can find out um, much more information on the CoSpace website where we've got a page that's dedicated to all of our findings. So those are our reports um, and also um, preprints from papers and findings from some of the um, other linked studies to the CoSpace project. So that brings me to an end. I'd just like to thank our team our funders, the UKRI and the Westminster Foundation. Um, I'd also like to thank um, the conference organisers, Emerging Minds Centre for Society and Mental Health um, and the Policy Institute for organising this conference. And thanks very much for listening. Great. Thanks very much. And I think in my excitement about the screen sharing, I um, didn't actually introduce Polly properly. So that was Polly Waite, who's an associate Professor of Clinical Psychology at the University of Oxford and the University of Reading and she's also a consultant clinical psychologist. Um, so I'm delighted now to move on to Dr Catherine Young who um, is a lecturer and MQ fellow 
at King's College London. And this um, all fits so nicely together because we're now going to hear particularly about the impacts of the pandemic on slightly older adolescents. So we're delighted to have you with us now, Katie. Over to you. Thanks very much. Thanks so much for having me. Um, just to check, you can see my slides there. Yeah, they're perfect, Katie. Great. Well done. Um, great, thank you. Uh, I'm going to jump right in. Uh, and yeah, as Kathy mentioned, my work is looking at um, adults generally, but we have data from 16 plus. So I'm going to focus on some emerging findings uh, related to young people. Uh, so first off, I just want to acknowledge the enormous team of people uh, that have been involved in this work to date. I'm the fortunate one who gets to come and talk about it, but it's a huge amount of work across a lot of people. So I'm going to talk about two studies today, but they're really sort of combined into one. Uh, these are the RAMP and coping studies, and overall we're also doing longitudinal assessments of mental health during the pandemic. Broadly, we're also looking at relationships between mental health and the neurological and respiratory symptoms of COVID, as well as bigger picture looking at cognitive and behavioral factors and the effects of stress over time. Today, I'm just going to focus on anxiety and depression and how that might have changed from before to after the beginning of the pandemic. So our studies, uh, they're both online questionnaire based studies. There's only two of them because they differ in who's within our studies. Um, in every other way, they're very similar. So RAMP recruited participants via social media starting in April 2020, so right at the beginning of the pandemic. Whereas in coping, we have participants from uh, pre-existing recontactable cohorts, um, including a large number of people who are part of the genetic links to anxiety and depression study. Uh, all of those people have um, pre-pandemic mental health data available. So a lot of today I'm going to be talking about changes um, in mental health. Um, and also just to note that a large proportion of individuals in both our studies have pre-existing mental health diagnoses. So we're able to look at um, these groups as perhaps particularly uh, people who are at risk. Our timelines, uh, we launched both the studies back in April uh, and initially we're assessing every two weeks and have been assessing every four weeks uh, since August last year and actually uh, continue to do so and plan to until uh, after the easing of restrictions. Um, so of course this covered periods of uh, lockdown and uh, eased restrictions as well. In terms of our sample, we have around uh, 35,000 people in total from all across the UK, uh, age 16 plus, uh, with predominantly female uh, and a predominantly white sample as well. So as mentioned um, in other talks, something to bear in mind. Uh, and in terms of looking at employment status, which we're also looking at as a risk factor, um, the majority of our participants were employed, but we do also have individuals who are retired, um, students and people who are unemployed as well. And as I mentioned, um, a large proportion of our participants have prior mental health diagnoses. So this is in particular uh, people with pre-existing anxiety or depressive disorders, um, but a large group of people, almost 12,000 with no diagnosis as well. So we're able to look at these differences. The three things I want to highlight today from our data so far is first to think about whether there's any change in symptoms of depression and anxiety from before to after the beginning of the pandemic. Secondly, how does this compare to perceived experiences of change in, me in uh, mental well-being? And I'll get into a little detail on that in a second. And then thirdly, to think about which groups are at greatest risk of worsening mental health. So just to say all the data I'm presenting today has not yet been uh, peer reviewed. So I'd be grateful if it wasn't shared uh, too widely beyond this already quite large uh, seminar. So first of all, uh, looking at change in symptoms of depression and anxiety from before to after the beginning of the pandemic. And by before, I mean at some point between September 2018 and February 2020, when people enrolled uh, in the GLAD study. And by after, I mean whenever they completed their first um, questionnaire, which was sometime between April and June in 2020. So here looking at symptoms of depression and also looking at symptoms of anxiety, uh, we see very little change in symptoms overall. You can see the, the bars for post-pandemic are slightly lower than the bars for pre-pandemic, but this uh, difference is, is so small, it's not considered clinically meaningful uh, in any way. But of course, just looking at the overall mean for a group doesn't show the whole picture. And when we look at the spread of data, here now showing before in green and after the beginning of the pandemic in pink, you can see we've got a really wide range of scores. And this is the same for depression and for anxiety. 
And when we calculate a different score, it becomes really clear that although the mean is around zero, there's huge numbers of people who are experiencing worsening symptoms, as well as a lot of people um, experiencing an improvement in symptoms as well. And um, so it's gonna be really important to figure out who are those individuals who are at greatest risk. Before I get on to that, uh, I wanted to highlight that um, just because we don't see any uh, changes in symptoms doesn't mean that people aren't experiencing differences in their mental well-being. So after completing uh, a questionnaire about current symptoms of depression and anxiety, we ask people, how different are these feelings to how you felt before the pandemic? When we do that, we see around 50% of people actually reporting their symptoms are worse and only six or 7% reporting an improvement in their symptoms. So this might be related to a number of different things that, that we um, want to look at further, uh, perhaps in relation to sort of short-term psychological distress, which doesn't necessarily translate to a change in symptoms, um, but it could also be uh, an indication of early changes uh, in mental well-being that might result in changes in symptoms in the longer term. So it'd be really important to look at this uh, in our follow-up data as well. One other thing we've been looking at in relation to this is about how you perceive a change in your own mental well-being. So uh, we also asked participants after, after asking them how much they thought their, their symptoms have changed to remember what they thought their symptoms were before the beginning of the pandemic. Um, so here uh, I'm showing you this, some of the same data as before, our pre-pandemic data here in green that was collected um, in 2018 to 2020, the baseline, which is our kind of current symptoms during the pandemic, and adding in yellow uh, a retrospective report. How do you think your symptoms were before the pandemic? And so what this seems to suggest is that people are maybe underestimating how bad their symptoms were before the beginning of the pandemic. And this might contribute to um, sort of perceived changes in well-being, but certainly something to look at a little bit more. So moving on to think about which groups are at greatest risk for worsening mental health. All of these analyses, uh, just for the sort of technical side, are a set of regression analyses. Uh, and with these plots, everything to the right-hand side of the dotted line indicates a worsening uh, in symptoms. I, I'm saying this is a worsening in symptoms because we're controlling for pre-pandemic mental health. So the best, best predictor we have of current mental health, of course, is past uh, mental health. That's what I'm showing here, that of course, pre-pandemic PHQ, which is depression and GAD, which is anxiety, is predictive of current depression and anxiety. But after we take into account that, uh, that effect, we can also look at other factors that are associated with higher levels of symptoms. When we do that, first of all, looking in relation to pre-existing mental health diagnoses, we see that um, comorbid depression and anxiety, so this is having a diagnosis of both a depression and an anxiety disorder, is associated with higher levels of current depression and anxiety, uh, and a prior diagnosis of depression only was associated with worse symptoms of depression. Eating disorders and obsessive compulsive related disorders were associated with worse symptoms uh, of depression and anxiety, as were uh, pre-existing diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder, autism spectrum disorders, and personality disorders. Next, looking at the effect of age, here we're comparing different age groups to our comparator group of 26 to 35 year olds. And we see quite a striking effect uh, of age with notably the 16 to 18 year olds and 19 to 25 year olds at greater risk for worsening depression and anxiety compared to a 26 to 35 year old age group. Whereas actually the older individuals within our studies are more likely to be showing a decrease uh, in symptoms of depression and anxiety. Next, looking at gender, uh, we have some evidence suggesting that females are at greater risk for worsening uh, anxiety, but not depression. Uh, and then looking at ethnicity, uh, as I mentioned, we have a predominantly white sample. So this uh, analysis was a little less well powered, but so far no evidence of significant differences based on ethnicity. Uh, and finally, thinking about employment status, uh, unemployed individuals uh, were at greater risk for worsening depression and anxiety, and students were at greater risk for worsening depression. 
So to briefly sum up, um, we are seeing no clinically meaningful change overall in symptoms of depression and anxiety, although around half of our participants are reporting a perceived worsening in mental health. And the people who are at greater risk of worsening mental health seem to be those with pre-existing mental health diagnoses, younger people, uh, perhaps some effects in females and students, and also individuals who are unemployed. So with that, I'll stop and thank you for, for your attention. Great, thanks very much indeed, Katie, and thanks to all our speakers uh, for keeping so brilliantly to time. Um, I'm now going to introduce our next speaker, who is Anne John, who is Professor of uh, Public Health and Psychiatry at the Swansea University Medical School. And Anne's going to be speaking to us about suicidal behaviours in young people in the COVID context. So, uh, Anne, are you OK with sharing your screen? Great, thank you. And I'm muting myself. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, suicide and suicidal behaviour over the pandemic. I think um, slides. basically at the beginning of the pandemic, when there was a lot of concern uh, during lockdown about rates of suicide and suicidal behaviour across all age groups, lots of mod modelling studies causing lots of concerning headlines. Um, Bristol and Swansea got together and set up a living review, a living systematic review to look at the data from around the world to see what was happening. I don't think we quite realised what we were taking on, um, but I'm going to present in this findings from a lot of the studies that we looked at. And I guess the reason it's, it can be really complicated to unpick what's really happening is that one, um, when people take their own lives, there needs to be an inquest. And that means that the actual recording of suicide deaths in mortality data is often delayed by up to a year, which is why a lot of the data that we talk about is based on real time data. The other issues are to do with surveys. There are loads of surveys. I think there were over 120 cross-sectional surveys and, and their findings can often be mixed and a lot of that's to do with the way people are sampled. So there's convenient samples where you just ask and it's usually people who are interested that will respond. There are probability samples where you know who hasn't responded as well as who has responded. Um, and some of those findings have been very mixed. And then there are a lot of studies about presentations to services. The age groups I'm gonna be talking about differ. So there are some in children, some where they call children and young people and that young people could be anything up to age 30. Um, and the time span varies. And I guess it's worth pointing out that prior to COVID, we were seeing an increase in young people, particularly older adolescents and females, in anxiety, self-harm and suicide rates. And I think one of the things we have to bear in mind when we're looking at all these changes is the secular trends that were happening anyway. And so it's a, it's, it's a complicated, as we've seen in the other presentations, picture to unpack. So near the beginning of lockdown, uh, the National Child Mortality Database looked at child suicides and raised what they called a signal of concern. So there were, there was an increase sort of what we call a rate ratio of 1.41. So, so it looked like an increase, but when you looked at the variability around that number, it wasn't there. So you couldn't say there was an increase. We said there was a signal of concern. And the, and the proportions of those young people who were currently in contact with mental health services were the same before lockdown and after. More recent data is 
is a, a bit more reassuring. So we're seeing numbers that are very similar to pre-pandemic. But I guess um, my message would be we have to remain vigilant. So data from um, Japan pretty much said the same thing. There's no, there wasn't any strong evidence of an increase in suicide in young people. If you look at the, the, the light gray line for 2019, the peak that you see around month nine was actually following the death of a, a celebrity. More recently, data from Japan. Now, Japan is very different to the UK. So it's, it's difficult to make, to, it's difficult to say that, that what we're seeing there may happen here, but, we, but it does raise causes for concern. So since August, there's been a rise in suicide rates in Japan um, compared to when the pandemic started, but also the previous three years. And that increase is predominantly in uh, young people and females. There's a few studies that have uh, found this. And this particular paper highlighted students, but another paper based on the same data has focused on children and young people. So there's something happening in Japan with this age group. And similarly in Japan, and this is, this is where you start um, seeing one, the differences between surveys and other data, but also the differences between um, suicidal thoughts, suicidal behaviours and self-harm, and people, young people actually taking their own lives. So many more people have thoughts of suicide than will go on to take their own lives. Many more people self-harm than will go on to take their own lives. So this survey of Chinese school children over two waves, um, directly related to school closures in Japan, did see increases in depressive symptoms, non-suicidal self-injury, thoughts of suicide plans and attempts. But what the issue here is, is we don't know the underlying secular trends. Self, suicide and self-harming behaviours tend to sort of peak in the sort of spring, summer, late autumn. So we don't know those seasonal differences. So May is when you'd expect to see those peaks. Um, we don't know the percentage of all the school children in the two counties in China this was based in. So we don't know who didn't reply. You know, and sometimes that's the people who are worried. Sometimes those who are most vulnerable are the ones who don't, who don't respond. Similarly, for um, emergency department attendance. So lots of people, you would have heard clinicians basically saying that they're seeing more presentations but similarly to most contacts with hospitals, presentations for self-harm fell. However, the percentage of, the, of those presentations to the emergency department that were for self-harm in young people increased by about 77%. And it may be that increase, that, that sort of proportional increase it gives people the impression that there's been there's that there's been an increase in presentation for self-harm. Similar things seen in GP consultations. Um, you know, if you think of all the slogans about protecting the NHS, we saw a huge drop, um, particularly in younger age groups, in self-harm presentations. There is some um, return to normal over time. But I guess when you're seeing for emergency department presentations and primary care that drop, what you think about is, is, is there a huge level of unmet need? Now we know that most people who self-harm don't present to services. Now in the, um, 
this is the UCL COVID study with, you know, over 72,000 respondents. We're not seeing huge changes in self-harm, particularly in um, young people or for um, thoughts of suicide. So it's a really, really mixed picture. Similar survey using u.gov, um, 4,000 people, but different people in every way. There is an increase in thoughts. So it's really, really difficult to give a definitive answer. I think, you know, the way I look at it is, is when I, is I basically think about what are the big risk factors for self-harm and suicidal behaviours pre-pandemic? You know, one of the big risk factors is um, financial insecurity and unemployment in families. And we know we're heading towards a recession. So I think there's a real issue of, you know, these things are difficult to count currently because people are presenting. And one of the, so basically we need to have clear crisis pathways and interventions so that we can mitigate those risks as they come along. That's everything for me. Great. Thanks very much indeed, Dan. And just a reminder to everyone who's joined us today that if, you, uh, if you've if you joined us live, if um, any of the things that we've spoken about today have raised particular difficulties or challenges for you, um, as we mentioned before, you can um, get in touch directly um, and confidentially with Lindsay, who's able to provide uh, sources of support. So in the chat, you'll be able to find her name, Lindsay, and in brackets, help and support message me. So just a reminder that that's available. Um, we're now going to go on to our next speakers. So I'm delighted to introduce um, Debbie Fry and Gillian McCluskey from the University of Edinburgh. So Debbie is a senior lecturer in child protection and co-direction director of the End Violence Lab, and Gillian is Professor of School Exclusion and Restorative Practice at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and so over to you, thanks very much for joining us. Great, thank you. Um, and we'll be co-presenting. So we'll be presenting today on a study called INIS, or In Isolation Instead of in School, Young People's Experiences of COVID-19 and Effects on Mental Health and Education. And this is co-funded by the Chief Scientist Office in Scotland and the Data for Children Collaborative with UNICEF. Um, so this study really looked at three main research questions. Um, the first one was how do isolation, but also school closure and exam cancellation affect the mental health of young people in Scotland generally? And then are there additional impacts on mental health of groups of young people typically identified as vulnerable? And then really importantly, what do young people as students think would help address their mental health concerns? Um, specifically during the COVID context. So there were two strands to this study. One was a cross-sectional online uh, national survey open from July to September of last year. Um, and we had a response rate of 759 uh, young people in the senior phase of secondary schools and also online focus group interviews, um, again, within a similar uh, time period. And we held four focus groups with um, about 45 uh, respondents. And I'm gonna hand over to Jillian, who's going to walk us through some of the preliminary findings. Um, thanks, Debbie, and, and hello, and thanks very much on behalf of, of the larger team uh, Debbie and I are here representing today. Um, so I'm going to talk very quickly about the first lot of findings on the left there, the school closures, and a bit more about the what would help at the end. Uh, the reason I'm going to speak more briefly about the first set of findings is they're quite preliminary. And uh, we're actually undertaking further analysis now of the survey data, which is what you're seeing there. That was the nearly 800 young people across the country who participated. Um, so what we've been able to say at this preliminary stage is that we were seeing young people 
uh, affected in different ways. And you can see the figures there. Um, I'm not going to read them out. Um, we were, we do also have, because this may, um, maybe a question you would ask is we did ask uh, about changes in perceptions. And um, this was not a, a study that actually was looking at diagnoses. It was, but we did ask about perceptions around change and that's actually part of the work that we're undertaking at present, the additional analysis. Um, what I'd like to do is spend a bit longer talking about the focus groups. Uh, Debbie said that we had 45 young people involved, age 14 to 18. We, we did all the work online. Um, the focus groups themselves involved uh, young people from 17 of our 32 local authorities across the country. And I've been noting in the chat the concern about the underrepresentation of uh, young people from black and minority ethnic backgrounds. So I would just, again, perhaps preempt a question on that and let you know that we had, um, of our 45 young people across the four groups, we had uh, 10 young people from uh, black and minority ethnic groups. We had five young people who preferred not to say what their uh, background was, uh, but we also know we had um, 10 that did identify. Um, so, Debbie, do you mind uh, taking us on to the, the examples? Um, what we were trying to do with the focus groups was really dig down into some of the survey data and to understand uh, what it was like to have the experiences that were being reported in the, in the surveys. And again, I'm not going to read through these. These are quotations from uh, young people, direct quotations from the focus groups, but maybe just to draw attention to the kinds of themes that these were raising. Um, the first one mentions OCD in particular, um, again, as an example, but this was a specific example that was given to us. Um, and we were interested here, concerned, I guess, too, about whether this might indicate that existing issues are being exa exacerbated for some young people. The example given by a young person talking about issues for LGB, LGBTQI, um, you know, our concern about the effect on equalities and protected characteristics. And I think a really nice example there of uh, the ways in which uh, something is not, um, it's, it's about the day-to-day -day experience being so disrupted and those day-to-day -day experiences being so valuable to young people who may be feeling vulnerable. Um, the third example there uh, was really what we were interested in was coming together with what school could offer differently. The fourth is, is reminding us of the specific effects that COVID added um, over and above any other existing issues for, for young people and their families. But we were also getting examples and I wanted to put, include one that indicated that for some young people, this was a positive and the sense of agency and having a structure they could impose on themselves and their day was really important for them. Thanks. We got lots of suggestions, many, many more than we could include here um, of what could help. Primarily, we were being told again and again and again that there was a need for um, teachers and this was not specialist teachers, this was um, all teachers to understand the need for time and space to reflect on all the things that have been happening. Uh, we were given a very kind of poignant example from one person which was then um, sort of resoundingly supported in a particular focus group uh, by a young person who said, I, you know, I went back into school and I wanted to spend time in my personal social education class talking about what had just happened and I was handed my UCAS form, my university application form. And when that young person said that, you know, there's the, I can't convey to you the strength of feeling that was immediately apparent in that focus group. But I guess that's, that's the advantage of actually asking these questions and hearing the responses live. Um, so training for teachers, absolutely vital, more training than they already have. You'll see here things also around physical activity and the positives around social media. We often hear about social media as a, a danger and a risk, but uh, for some people, some of the time, uh, digital connectivity, uh, either by school or separately under, under their own steam through social media was really important. So finally, let's just uh, 
say again, we're in the middle of further analysis. So these are very preliminary. Uh, we haven't been able to put a link to our final report because we were expecting it to be out at the end of last week. Um, but the funder uh, is publishing a lot of reports all at once. Ours we know is okay, but we think the issue is with something else in the body of reports they want to put out on the same day. So apologies, we can't share a link today. Um, but we've been actively uh, in conversations with all these groups here to try and disseminate some of the early preliminary findings already. Thank you very much indeed. Right, thank you ever so much and lovely to hear um, a bit more from your qualitative study as well to complement all of the other data that we've heard about today. Um, and great, it uh, really leads us nicely into the next talks where we'll be hearing more uh, from young people's perspectives. So first of all, um, I want to introduce Rebecca Watson, Elise Sellers and members of the Co-Ray Young People's Advisory Group from the University of Oxford, who are going to present an overview of the Co-Ray project, which is looking at designing mental health resources to support the mental health and well-being of young people during the pandemic. So um, Rebecca is a postdoctoral researcher and Elise a research assistant in the departments of experimental psychology and psychiatry. So I'll hand over to you both now. Thanks very much. Great, thanks, Cathy. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to be talking today alongside my colleague Elise and also Ishal, who is a member of our Young People Advisory Group. So she's going to be talking a little bit about her experiences and also reflecting on the experiences of other young people in our advisory group who are from um, age 11 upwards. So as, as Cathy's already highlighted there, so CoRay is a knowledge mobilisation project. So it's funded by the Medical Research from Westminster Foundation and the aim is to produce a set of evidence-based resources to support young people's mental health and well-being and um, specifically during the COVID pandemic context. So this is um, a research project rather than us um, collecting our own empirical data. So we're going to be briefly outlining um, the project, the kind of process that we're going through, hearing about the impact of the pandemic on young people's mental health from our advisory group um, and highlighting our plans for the project moving forwards um, and kind of initial plans for our resource production. Thanks, Becca. Great. So yeah, over 18 Great. months, we are completing two iterations of the following cycle. A rapid evidence synthesis to collect evidence on the effects of the pandemic on young people's aged 11 to 16 mental health and well-being. Then, using the themes identified in the research synthesis, we're going to be completing priority setting exercises with groups of young people across the UK to see whether the themes resonate with young people and what their priorities for receiving mental health and wellbeing support are. We are then discussing the priority setting exercise findings with our Young People's Advisory Group to reach a consensus on the areas of mental health and wellbeing to focus resource production on. The final step is then to work with young people and our production partners to produce a range of accessible and engaging resources for young people. Next slide, please. So based on the results of our first priority setting exercise, we reached the consensus that our first round of resources will focus on supporting young people with the following areas feeling bored, flat and unmotivated, managing change and uncertainty, feeling lonely, isolated and disconnected and encouraging young people to seek help if they're struggling with their mental health. So I'm now going to hand over to Ishal, who's a member of our Co-Ray Young People's Advisory Group, who's going to share the feedback of other Co-Ray group members on these four areas, as well as her reflection on the areas. Thanks Ishal. Hi, uh, my name is Isha, and as Elise said, I'll be just talking you through what everyone else thought and some of my own ideas. So the first priority area is feeling bored, flat and unmotivated. I can personally relate to this. Over the past couple of months, I've really struggled with staying motivated for school. It's a bit like, what's the point of doing the work if we don't even know if we're going to go back and the teachers will be even able to check it? And as Will says, the whole week just merges into one big long day of which everything is the same. And the way to combat this, I suppose, is making sure you have variety in your everyday routines. And as he says, we need to move around and get a change of scenery. As Dylan says, most of our time is spent on Zoom or team calls. So we're staring at a screen 
for seven hours a day and that can be very draining and it can leave you feeling flat and unmotivated because you don't have much else to do. Next slide, please. The next priority area is managing change and uncertainty. Everything has been up in the air recently, especially with school and exams for young people. I'm in year 11 and there's been a lot going on with our exams. We were going to school and revising for exams. We didn't even know if we were going to sit. And as Darcy says, not being able to go to school and not being able to see your friends or your loved ones has been particularly hard. And it's had a big impact on young people's mental health because nothing has been told to us beforehand. For example, with returning to school, we were only told the night before we were supposed to go back that we wouldn't be returning. And that's a big change for young people because you get all excited about returning and then at the last minute you find out you're not going back. And as Ollie says, some people have got no brothers or sisters to play with. So you're left by yourself, I suppose, with no one else your age to talk to in your everyday interactions. Next slide, please. The third priority area is feeling lonely, isolated and disconnected. I'm an only child, so I don't have any siblings with whom I can spend my time around the house. And having no company your own age can be very isolating because it's just you with your own thoughts. And as Zach says, you can have a loss of purpose or identity, which being part of a team or a group might give you. An example of this is I'm sure the new year sevens who are coming into secondary school this year. They don't feel as connected to their peers, their friends, their classes as they would do if they were in school, as he says, having those small interactions in the playground or school corridors that help maintain friendships. And at a certain point, at the start of lockdown, my friends and I, we were doing quizzes, we were having group calls every week. But at one point, as Amelie says, there's only so much you can talk about or do online and you need to take a step back and find that balance between doing what you enjoy with your friends and taking care of your own mental health. Next slide, please. The last and final priority area, which I think is the most important, is overcoming barriers to getting help and support with mental health difficulties. As Cassia says, young people might not seek help because they don't know if it's unnecessary, they don't know who to go see, they don't know which services they can use. And I think a really important thing is sometimes young people can struggle to realize that they're having mental health difficulties because what we tend to do is be like everyone's going through this they don't need help so why should I be getting help as she says young people need more than just digital help as they need more personal feedback and advice but that can be difficult to get especially during this pandemic when everything has moved online some of my own thoughts were that young people might not seek help because they don't want to waste the medical professional's time, especially during a time like this. They don't want to put unnecessary stress on their friends, their family, their loved ones and the NHS. And within a lot of communities, especially ethnic minority communities, it can be hard to receive the help you need at home. Your parents might not know how to help because they don't know what's wrong or who to reach out to, or they might refuse to get help because they refuse to acknowledge that there's a problem in the first place. Great, thank you so much Isha, that's really, really brilliant. So now we've got those kind of four priority areas. Um, we've been working with a range of clinical and research experts to establish a set of key recommendations or messages that we want to underpin the set of resources that we're going to be making. So we wanted to produce uh, messages that would be clear, simple um, for a non-specialist audience. So I've just displayed a few examples of the messages here. I can also put the links to um, these evidence-informed briefings in the chat as well. So for example, for feeling bored and unmotivated, um, encouraging young people to identify what their personal values are, what matters to them, and then doing more of what matters. Helping with loneliness and isolation, messages included reaching out to others where, where possible, helping other people, um, and also avoiding social comparison and focusing on the type of relationships they wanted. And support with managing change and uncertainty included uh, messages around learning to sit with uncertainty um, in certain circumstances, accepting that uncertainty rather than fighting against it. 
um, and paying more attention to, to what was going on right now. And then the last area, encouraging young people to seek help and support, included some practical advice um, for, you know, reaching out in terms of professional support, but also reaching out support from family and friends. Um, so reminding young people not to be put off asking for help. Um, as Ishaus mentioned there, it can be hard for young people maybe to know when to reach out for help and trying to not be discouraged if other people don't necessarily get it caught quite right straight away, but kind of persisting um, with asking for that support when needed. So we're now working with our uh, really brilliant production partners, which include two youth led organisations, fully focused productions who predominantly um, create film based content, Headlines UK specialise in media and journalism, as well as working uh, with the Department of Typo Typography and Graphic Design at Reading University, as well as BBC Bite Size to create a range of resources um, to support young people in these four different topic and um, kind of priority areas in the coming months so they'll include drama infographics and, and podcasts so and um, we haven't got any of those to show you today unfortunately but <clears throat> we'll certainly keep um, keep you up posted on our, on our website <clears throat> And as, as her, um, Elisa highlighted at the beginning, we're going through two iterations of this project. So in the summer, we're going to look back at what um, the evidence says, some of the more recent evidence from 2021 about the impact of the pandemic, um, and focusing as well on groups of young people who might have been missed or might not um, be reflected um, as, as much in the evidence. So the voices of hard to, greet, hard to reach groups of young people who might have been particularly affected by the pandemic. So thank you very much to our Young People's Advisory Group for, for your contributions today, as well as for your input on our project overall. So I'll thank you to Emily Lloyd and Kathy Cresswell who are working with us on the project and our production, uh, so our project partners, which are listed here and our funders. Thank you very much. Great, thanks very much guys and a special massive thanks to Isha there for representing the young people in the advisory group and I can see there's a lot of love for you Isha in the chat so do have awesome. a look at that. Um, thanks ever so much and we look forward to hearing more from you when we come to the panel discussion shortly uh, but prior to that I'd like to introduce you all to Meg Kiesa-Lever, who's reporting on a, a similar rapid knowledge mobilisation project called Keeping Cool, being run at King's College London. And Meg is a research assistant in the Social Genetic and Developmental Psychiatry Centre at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience at King's College London. So thanks for joining us, Meg. Thank you very much, Cathy. So today I would like to tell you about the project we have uh, been working on, uh, which is hopefully going to be released in a few weeks. So the COVID-19 lockdown has been a perfect storm for child and adolescent mental health, marked by high rates of emotional symptoms. On the one hand, there have been more stressors. For example, young people may be worried about their health or that of their loved ones, or have experienced loss in the family. On the other hand, with school closures and limited access to services, there has been less support available. During lockdown, fewer young people have access to camps and other support systems, which might have been enlisted in part because of reduced contact with GPs and schools. Besides, many young people felt the pandemic prevented them from seeking help. Therefore, we were interested in providing universal support to young people and their families, going beyond traditional provision, and thought about how to deliver coping advice to parents and young people without them having to leave the house. So early on, we focused on parents as people who could support their children in the absence of traditional support institutions. The principal investigator, Professor Andrea Danese, has written advice for BBC Bite Size, which is available through the link on the slides, and co-created a series of short films called Families Under Pressure, which focus on helping children deal with emotional symptoms. By enabling parents through this coping advice, we, could, we thought that we could address many universal needs of children. However, based on the epidemiological evidence, we became more and more concerned about the mental health of young people, secondary school age and older, and thought about how to shift the work to address their needs. We kept the focus on coping advice, but adapted the delivery to make it more engaging for young people. 
but the lessons tend to want to gain more agency and often begin to see parents as less important than peers in providing support. So we thought about co-creating materials and content with young people to address their needs. Based on our work to support parents early in the lockdown, we have worked on a UKRI funded project to co-develop psychoeducational material to support young people with emotional symptoms. This project focuses on basic emotions, anxiety, sadness and anger, rather than on clinical conditions, because those emotions are experienced by everyone at some point and everyone can relate to them, so it's a universal message. Besides, we wanted to reduce stigma around those emotions. We have worked closely with young people to gather their views and experiences on what the emotion feels like, when they tend to experience it, and how they deal with it. We wanted to engage young people in the communication of advice as much as possible. The philosophy behind Keep Cool is that we act as facilitators who provide a platform to young people to share their experiences and structure the coping advice that they give. The videos are co-produced with the young people recruited by McPain Foundation. We wanted to present the opinions of young people rather than clinicians or other experts, use the narrative provided by them and incorporate their feedback in the design of the videos. First, we introduced the young people recruited by McPin and to the project that we were working on and then we prioritized the emotions with them. So second, we discussed each emotion in more detail, so what it is, what it feels like, when they experience it, and what they find helpful in dealing with it. The scripting and design are done by a production company called Totes, and uh, we also receive feedback from young people on the production process. Dote have also collected videos from young people so that the stories would be told in their own voice. And we selected the stories that are in line with clinical advice, and we work with the young people to polish the videos that will go into the final product. Then we present the videos to the young people and collect their feedback, which is later incorporated in the production of the further videos. And uh, we are also going to be working with young people on creating social media content to support the dissemination of the videos. Based on this information, we're producing the videos, uh, which are designed for sharing on social media. And it focuses on one emotion, anxiety, sadness, and anger. And they will be released in the spring and summer, so watch this space. We would like to thank our wonderful partners, McQueen Foundation, um, Passion Digital, helping us with the dissemination, and Toad are producing the videos. And the national specialist comes, Drama Anxiety and Depression Clinic, are uh, helping us with the clinical advice. Uh, we're just setting up our social media and we will be releasing the videos later in the spring and summer, the first coming out in a few weeks. So if you would like to follow us on social media, then you will see when they come out. So thank you very much. Wonderful. Thanks very much, Meg. And we're really looking for, look forward to seeing those outputs. So we're now going to um, have a brief panel discussion. And for this, I'd like to introduce you to um, two more people that you haven't met yet. So you obviously all met Ishal earlier on today, who will be joining us for the Q&A. But we're also joined by two other young people. So Lucy, who's an expert by experience, who's been involved in the CoRay project, but also sits on the McPin Foundation's Young People's Advisory Group. And also Stuart, who's involved in the Keep Cool project that we've just heard about at King's College London, and is also a young advisor for healthy teen minds and a youth worker for projects for change. So we don't have a huge amount of time and I will be going to them first because I've seen how much people have really appreciated hearing, um, particularly young, from Ishel earlier on today. So um, I will go to um, Stuart, Lucy and Ishel first of all. One of the questions that we um, received and lots of people have commented on is obviously there've been there's been huge variety in people's experiences during the pandemic and lots of the speakers have spoken to the, the, the findings that 
Um, while some people have struggled, others may have thrived, uh, whereas others may have been fairly unaffected. And it's uh, they've discussed various risk factors that might have made a difference to that. And one of the things I suppose is quite striking and people have commented on as well in the chat is that some young children and young people may have seen some benefits as a result of, for example, not being in the classroom. So I was keen to come to you and just hear your thoughts about that based on maybe your own or the experiences of the people that you know about whether there's anything we can learn from potential benefits that people have experienced that might be useful for us to know about as we plan going forwards. Um, so Stuart, Lucy, Ishel, I don't know if any of you would like to comment on that. Um, hi everyone, I'm Stuart. Thanks, Stuart. Um, thanks. thanks. Um, so, what is this? It's quite interesting what, 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 what you just mentioned about the benefits that came out of uh, people not being in, yeah, people not being in classes because I work the year. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, so, sorry, Stuart. We're not hearing you. I've asked some young people how they experienced worse. So there was a bit of stress when the exams were cancelled, and then some of them sort of found relief to the alternative forms of education. So, oh, oh, I think we've lost you there. Yeah, but I could hear you were saying that for some people there was certainly a, a sense of relief at some, some point. Okay. okay, let's let's leave that one there. So sorry, I can't, I'm afraid we can't hear you very well. Um, but um, I wanted to um, also, oh, not brilliantly. Let's go on to the next uh, the next point, which which is related. Um, but I suppose also picking up on the fact that some young people have um, have struggled and that um, obviously now many young people who have been home learning recently will and will now be sort of getting ready to return to face to face schooling. Um, and so we had questions about whether there are any tips for teachers on how to best support children and young people as they return um, to school. And I think the questions were particularly, to, you know, referring to the, um, a lot of the emphasis on catching up and what your views are on that. So um, Stuart, Ishan or Lucy, would any of you like to comment on that? I think an important thing to remember is that they can't expect every child to be at the same level as they were before the pandemic or even after the pandemic, every single child has gone through something different. So, you know, someone might have had a family loss and they've been really struggling, whereas someone else might have had it relatively easy, as easy as you can get it through this pandemic. So it's important to remember that, I mean, at least for a couple of months, not everyone is going to be at the same level of ability or at the same learning stage. And that's OK, because you can't dump too much on your students, otherwise their mental health goes down again. Thanks. Thanks very much, Ishal. Um, I don't know whether any of our um, other speakers from today wanted to comment on that on that point, whether they would have any messages for school staff at the moment. Gillian, were you, did you want to say something? Um, I just wanted to back up everything that's been said about the experiences of young people. It's come through really loud and clear, but perhaps also to add that when we were saying that there's not enough in place for teachers, I still sense that there's an enormous willingness on the part of teachers to do a good job by these young people as they return. Now, remembering that in Scotland, some young people did go back um, and are already in schools, the practical subjects and those who would otherwise be doing exams this year. And I think I wouldn't want to underestimate the, the, the huge efforts that staff in schools have made throughout this time. And, where it's, where it's been able to help the young people we spoke to, and we actually had a young people's advisory group too, and this came through from them as well, is it has been hugely appreciated, hugely valued and made a massive difference. So where the support has been put in place, it's, it's made all the difference for some young people. So we just need more of it, like, like, the, like we've been saying, so. Thanks very much, Gillian. Anne. 
So I guess in the way that we, you know, all, all afternoon we've been hearing about that mixed experience, there are lots of young people who have found it almost a relief not to be in the school environment with all the pressures socially and educationally that that creates. So the, the returning to school will also create tension for them. And I think the focus on, so we know that how well, how well educated people are, how well they do can be protective for mental health. But I think we can't, we shouldn't over-focus on that in the beginning. It's getting young people used to, in a gradual way, um, being back to sort of a much more normal life. And then also understanding that, you know, in all the studies, the focus on social connection and loneliness were some of the biggest impacts for young people. So, you know, a lot of, I think, the school return should be focusing on those things. Thanks very much. And um, one of the things that was also highlighted in the talks is, you know, as we said, many young people, um, you know, young people who may have been particularly vulnerable to mental health difficulties prior to the pandemic appeared to be, um, you know, unsurprisingly, continuing to be vulnerable during the pandemic. And in some cases, those risks might have been amplified. Um, and so the, there was a question particularly about how uh, school staff, practitioners, parents could better support those young people who have additional needs. Um, and um, and I know, know, Stuart, that was something we're keen to comment on. So should we just try again briefly and see if how we can get on? Stuart, can you hear us? Uh, hello. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, all right. Um, yes. So... And, and this question, I, I was going to sort of draw lessons from how communities have supported people who are, who are vulnerable or who are shielding, because we had mutual aid groups connecting with charities, connecting with the local council and connecting with um, the NHS and all the other resources that are available. So in terms of school, this could be a school connect, connecting with youth groups, alternative groups which young people interact with to sort of get enough to get a full picture of what support needs they need and also to stop our young people falling through the cracks. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks very much, Stuart. And before we finish for today, one thing that I'm really keen to hear people's thoughts on is about the what they feel the implications of the pandemic will be on young people's well-being and mental health in the future. Obviously with research, we can only ever look backwards. Um, so it's really, it will be, it'd be really interesting, I think, to hear your thoughts on what we're looking at now going forwards. Um, so Ishao, I, I know you had some thoughts on this. Um, so I think everyone's dealt with the pandemic in different ways and it's been really hard for young people. Uh, everyone's had different challenges, different things to deal with. But I think the main thing that's going to impact on, like that has had an impact on our well-being, uh, is that we are better equipped to deal with challenges and struggles. I suppose because COVID is the defining bit of our generation. It's the one thing that's going to shape us as who we are, and we've been through a lot. And because of what we've been through, it's made us a lot more resilient and able to deal with challenges. And I think it's also made everyone a lot more aware of their mental health. So I'm sure before COVID, people weren't putting this much time into thinking about how to properly take care of themselves. And during the pandemic, because there's been such a big push on taking care of yourself and your own mental health, I think that's definitely something that young people will have to keep in mind for the future, you know, with um, upcoming studies and stress and everything that comes with growing up. Thanks very much, Ishao. And that's really nice to think that those positives uh, may have come from this experience. Um, Stuart, I think you also had some th thoughts on this. Oh, we can't, we can't hear you at the moment. So we'll, we'll just go to our other speakers. Um, would any of you like to comment on this point about how you see things uh, looking going forward in terms of children and young people's mental health and well-being? Tamsin, I wondered if you had uh, any thoughts, given you're going to be looking at this uh, in the not very distant future, whether you had any thoughts on what you're anticipating? 
Goodness, I'm going to slightly cop out here, Kathy, and say it's really hard to say. Um, we're, we're absolutely fascinated to go back to those same young people that we, we, we spoke to in summer or saw online in the summer, again in the spring and, in, and this summer coming. You know, I think we will see, it will be interesting to see how much of that sort of rise in problems that we saw is, is maintained and which children seem to sort of recover more quickly from that and which go on to have ongoing problems. And I think we might have an idea about who those might be, but we might be surprised. Um, and I think there will be something about, um, I think there is something about that balance of how we handle the recovery and taking forward the positive things. But also, I don't think we should be too quick to move on and not acknowledge the experience of those who found this very hard. It's not going to be you know, we might all be back doing what we normally do in July, but that doesn't mean the experience will be over for those children and young people. So I think really sort of, you know, improving chances and handling the recovery well for everybody over the next few years is where we really need to be thinking. It's not going to be a short term thing. Um, I'll stop in case anyone else wants to go in because we've still got a minute or two. <laughs> I could say something. Yes, Katie. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think it's such a great point. It's actually one of the things we're planning to do moving forward with our work as well as noticing the effects in young people. We're currently co-designing a stress measure with young people to think specifically about what are the stressors beyond just the fact that we're living in a pandemic that young people are facing uh, and how are you responding to those and how do you think about those stressors? Um, so that's what's going to be the focus of our work for the next year as we continue to follow up young people into the longer term, thinking about how does it influence how you respond to future stressors, are there things that we can learn from that, and how do we build that into a bigger, sort of better understanding of how to support responses to stress in general across, uh, particularly for us, adolescents and, and that transition into young adulthood. Thanks very much. And I'll just go now to uh, Lucy, who's the other young person on our panel, to hear her thoughts on uh, what we're likely to be looking at going forwards. Hi, everyone. Um, so I just wanted to offer a counter um, view to Isha, a bit less optimistic, but I think that for a lot of young people, um, there will be an epidemic of mental health issues after um, restrictions have lifted. Um, and I think that services need to be prepared for this because obviously, some people deal with things as in they keep in their um, symptoms and things until they process them and that could be you know in a year's time um, and I think a lot of people will be left with um, traumatic experiences from this pandemic. Thanks very much Lucy and really important point to raise so I guess to all of our uh, researchers here you know please do carry on uh, because uh, we it's going to be really important that we catch to those experiences so we can respond to them going forwards and I suppose that also takes us nicely on to um, thinking about the next two sessions that we have in this conference that I just wanted to flag up before we finish so tomorrow uh, today we've obviously been talking in about quite broad trends in terms of child and adolescent mental health but tomorrow we're going to be particularly focusing on the evidence base in relation to disadvantaged, marginalised and vulnerable groups. So looking particularly at what the evidence tells us on the differential impacts of COVID-19 and the associated restrictions on the mental health of young people in those groups. So please do join us for that tomorrow. It's at a later time of 4.30 till 6. We're sort of moving things around to try and give everyone the opportunity to join something. Um, but also as, uh, as today, everything will be on YouTube afterwards. Then on Wednesday, we'll be very much trying to look forward and think about the impacts in the short, but also the medium and long, ter long term, including thinking about how the social and economic consequences of the pandemic may affect young people's mental health, drawing on our knowledge from other areas and other experiences, and also looking at what the likely challenges are going to be going forwards, but some of the opportunities that we might have. So please do join us for that. If you haven't already signed up, please do, um, and uh, or if not, please join us on YouTube. I will just, um, just try and multitask again in order to share this with you, which hopefully you can see now, uh, which is a lovely picture of Anne, who you've seen today with us, uh, just to flag up the yeah. MQ conference, um, what has COVID-19 taught us about our mental health, the MQ Science Summit, which will be on the 12th and 13th of May. So if you'd like to keep hearing more on this topic, tickets for that now are available so please do join that um, so i'd just like to finish by thanking all of our speakers today 
um, and uh, all of the team who've organised um, this event, particularly Elise Sullivan, Becca Watson, who've done a fantastic job of organising so many parts of it. And obviously a huge thank you to Elise, Stuart and Lucy, who've also joined us today. And I, I can see by all of your comments how valuable it's been to have their perspectives throughout. So thank you all for joining us and I hope you'll be able to join us again later in the week. Thanks very much. Goodbye.